the security is tested in the in the payment cards. And finally, I will I will present a sanctional attack, one of the sanctional attacks which can be used against payment cards in case the the security is not implemented properly. Uh, <coughs> So first, uh, before we talk about uh, payment cards, we need to define what the payment card is. Um, uh, so this is the, uh, the definition of the card. Uh, basically, currently on your, on your card, like credit card, debit card, uh, fleet card, or something similar, uh, you have your information, you have cryptographic keys which are implemented on a microcontroller, um, this microcontroller has some cryptographic coprocessors uh, which can handle the communication and the encryption. Um, and uh, such card enables you to, uh, to do the operations which are connected uh, with your credit account or with your bank account, uh, etc. Uh, so how it all started? It uh, started late uh, 40s in the uh, US. Uh, there was a guy called Frank McNamara. Um, he used to go to a local dining establishment every day with his friends, um, and every time someone else, uh, every time someone uh, was paying out of this group of friends. And one evening, he realized he forgot his wallet, and uh, his wife had to bail him out. And uh, he was thinking, "I come here almost every day. Why do I need to?" Um, take my wallet and uh, pay all the time. Why can't I just have some some simple token? And at the end of the month, uh, the the restaurant will basically charge all the all the uh, cost associated with the meals I had during this month. So that's basically how a diners club was established. Um, it started spreading um, around the United States. Uh, in, in two years, it was in all the major U.S. cities. However, this was only for, uh, for dining. So a um, couple of years later, uh, Bank of America issued uh, Bank America card, which was the first credit card. So basically, it worked in the same principle as the diner's card. The difference was uh, now you could pay in all the merchants which were supporting this uh, Bank America card. So whenever you saw the logo, you could just uh, handle your card and you didn't have to pay uh, with uh, physical money. Um, later that year, Amer the, the first American Express was issued. And uh, one year later, American Express issued the first embossed card. So the embossed card uh, is a card where, you, where all the important characters like your name, the account number, etc., uh, is raised uh, from the card so that the merchant can just uh, swipe uh, a carbon paper with a normal paper and, uh, and the details will be imprinted on the, on the paper. So that's how he can use the bill uh, to charge you later. Uh, in 1960, IBM introduced uh, Maxtribe. Uh, so Mag stripe is the magnetic, the black magnetic stripe, uh, which is used in the cards uh, up to this date. Uh, however, it took roughly 10 years until the Mag stripe was uh, adopted commercially. Uh, later, in 1966, uh, there was a group of bank which uh, created a so-called mass charge. They were trying to compete with the Bank America. Uh, I think you know the logo. Uh, basically, Master Charge later uh, changed into MasterCard. Um, and in the 70s, already 100 million of people were using uh, the credit cards uh, in the United States. And uh, three years later, the transaction system became uh, computerized. Uh, I will talk uh, briefly on how, how the transaction system actually worked. Uh, before it was computerized. And um, in 1967, um, uh, the Bank America card was actually used by, by a group of banks, not only by uh, Bank of America. So they united and uh, 
they, they, uh, they release the common brand, which is uh, now known as Visa. So this is how Bank America card uh, looked like, and uh, it, uh, it changed uh, into Visa. So how the first transaction worked? Um, whenever a customer was buying something from the merchant, uh, the merchant had to take the card and uh, call the, the, the call merchant's bank. <coughs> and the merchant's bank had to call uh, the credit card company to check whether the transaction is allowed uh, and uh, whether such amount can be charged etc. So the credit card company was looking at the customer's name and, uh, and the credit balance and then uh, it charged the amount uh, to this customer. Uh, so how the stolen cards were handled, uh, it was in a way that the books with the lists of stolen cards were distributed to the merchants and um, it was on merchants to check whether the card is stolen or not. Uh, so of course this entire process uh, was quite slow and um, it might took a couple of minutes until the merchant could actually charge your card. So uh, if you for example imagine a coffee shop in the morning and there is queue of people and if, if every single person wants to pay by credit card and it takes, I don't know, two, three minutes uh, only to check the credit card, it would be super slow. So the merchants actually uh, often assumed uh, the risk of smaller transactions. So let's say if coffee at that time cost 50 cents, um, they were assuming uh, the risk, for example, up to one dollar. So if someone was just buying one, two coffees, they, were, they, they store the information from the card, and then later that day when uh, when they were not so busy, they would just call the bank and they would just uh, give them the list of these cards to charge them all at once. Uh, of course, um, it was done in a way that merchants who did not follow the verification procedure were liable for, for the fraudulent charges. So if you went to this coffee shop with a, with a stolen card, uh, you had uh, quite a high chance that uh, it would just go through. Uh, later there were uh, magnetic stripe uh, transactions. Um, we have them uh, until today, so uh, the cars are not fully computerized. Uh, even if you have the chip, uh, you can also pay in, in most of the merchants by, by magnetic stripe. Uh, the procedure is very similar to uh, to classic tapes. Basically, the magnetic stripe uh, stores the data, uh, but in the tape, the mechanism rotates the tape so that it can be read by the by the reading head. Um, in case of these cards, the basically the human who is operating the card has to swipe the card uh, through the reader. Uh, there are two or three tracks on the magnetic stripe. Uh, normally just two are used and uh, they store all the all the important information uh, so currently the pin is encrypted but of course when it was released in the 60s and 70s uh, there was uh, no strong encryption so it was just stored in the plain text so what were the security issues again uh, the liability was still on the merchant to check whether the, the card is uh, genuine or not. Um, another thing was if the transaction did not take place in the terminal, so if some clerk had to take the card, um, he could easily swipe it through some fraudulent uh, reader first and store all the customer's data. Then he could charge uh, later the amount he wanted. Uh, even, even at the terminal, uh, if, uh, if the thief was good enough, he could just swipe it directly through two, two devices, one the proper one and one the fraudulent one, and uh, still have all the information. So uh, this made uh, <coughs> the cloning of the cards very easy and even more common than before when the, when the embossed cards 
uh, were used. So now we come into, uh, into electronic cards. Um, so surprisingly, actually the, the change to electronic cards wasn't because of fraudulent charges or anything. It was because uh, whenever the verification took place, uh, they had to call the credit cards company, which were all in the United States. So uh, in Europe, uh, they decided this is too expensive and they want some other way to verify the cards. So they started uh, the EMV in 1993. So this abbreviation of, of these three companies, Europe, MasterCard, and Visa. Uh, currently, Europe is under MasterCard. And later, these, uh, these were joined by some other companies, and they, they together created EMV Co., which is currently the main certification body for all the electronic cards. So whenever you have some electronic card in, the, in your pocket, it is certified by, by the EMV Co., which is the umbrella organization uh, releasing the protocols uh, and releasing the security guidelines, etc. So the first system was released in 1994, and uh, basically this is how we know the cards until today. So instead of the, <coughs> of the information which is directly visible, uh, we have the chip which is hidden, hidden un under the contact area of the card and which does all the, all the computation. So in the United States the situation was different. Um, in the US uh, the calls were still cheap so they didn't feel the need uh, to change into electronic cards. They were still using magnetic stripe uh, mostly until 2014. Um, they, however, the credit card losses went up to over 5 billion in uh, 2012, which was a really huge amount. Um, in the end, this amount, it had to be paid by credit card companies to the banks. So the credit card companies uh, they had to buy really expensive insurances. Uh, and uh, of course, at the very end, these insurances were paid by the end customers. So that's why uh, the annual fees of the cards uh, were or still are uh, relatively high. So basically, the highest portion of your annual fee for your credit card actually goes to the, to the insurance company. So in 2014, uh, all the major credit card brands uh, decided to force the, uh, the banks and the merchants to use the electronic transactions. So they shifted the liability in the way. Uh, they said in case the merchant doesn't use the, the electronic uh, transaction, he is liable for uh, liable for the for the loss in case the card is uh, not cheap. So both the merchants and the acquirers had to implement uh, the EMV protocols, which means they had to have the uh, the terminal from the bank, and uh, they had to use it. So when we look at the graph of the percentage of the electronic transactions. Uh, we can see that, uh, for example, Africa and Middle East, uh, Canada, basically the rest of the America except US and uh, Europe was, uh, was already pretty high uh, in 2014. Um, the Asia was around 20%. Uh, the United States were roughly around zero. But after the shift of liability, uh, this changed rapidly. So uh, here in Asia, uh, there were over 50% of electronic transactions uh, in the United States. It went from zero to, to 40%. So the merchants really uh, started caring about uh, using secure way of payment. Uh, so to summarize how the, how the entire system evolved, so first of all, 
in the first cars, uh, we had the embossing. Uh, here we can see the embossing machine. So the merchant would put the card here, then he would put the carbon paper, and then put the bill, then he would swipe uh, this uh, black handle and imprint all the information which is on the card. In the 70s, we had uh, magnetic stripes, so uh, it was uh, relatively similar to this first method, only that it was much easier to, to automate it and to do the transaction uh, electronically. Uh, however, both methods were very insecure. Uh, so in 1993, uh, the EMV Co. Uh, started releasing the, the cards with the chips. And now we will look how the, how the EMV transactions work. So how it works whenever you put your card into the terminal. Uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, the main benefit of EMV is the security. Uh, so they use cryptography to protect all the transactions and all the data which is stored uh, in the card. Um, uh, currently, the, the standards uh, which, uh, which are used for, for this, the, the international ISO standards, uh, specify a set of different protocols. Uh, they are relatively old, so they still use uh, relatively old cryptography such as triple dash or SHA-1. However, f um, for now uh, it seems uh, it's still enough and they are slowly transiting into other types of uh, transactions. Uh, another benefit is uh, you can have uh, multiple applications on your card. So before when there was magnetic stripe there wasn't enough space to put uh, different applications. But now on one card you can have, let's say, debit card, credit card, transport card, etc. Uh, normally the card uh, uses Java card environment, so each application is in a form of uh, Java applet. And nowadays, if everything is implemented properly, you can't clone the card easily. So this is uh, the pin layout of the of the contacts uh, which are which are on the card, uh, you can see that it's a relatively standard pin layout of a, of a microcontroller. So you have you have the power supply, uh, clock signal, and the input output signal to communicate with the terminal. Uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, so this is the contact area, which is. Uh, <coughs> which is relatively big, and the chip below it takes uh, roughly 10 to 20% of the contact area. So you can see the, the size of the chip is really very small. Uh, the chip itself is uh, embedded integrated circuit. Um, it is operating according to a set of standards. Um, just like any other uh, current embedded uh, circuit, it contains uh, memory, so the memory stores uh, normal data. Then there are secure parts of the memory which can, uh, which can store the encryption keys, uh, pin code, etc. And uh, we have a general purpose microcontroller often supported with, uh, with crypto coprocessors uh, to do the, uh, so the general purpose microcontroller handles the communication and the uh, crypto coprocessors handle the encryption or or any part of the computation which is supposed to be secure. Uh, as I mentioned, um, the, the manufacturers often use Java Card because it's very convenient. Uh, so you can imagine Java Card uh, virtual environment as an operating system, and then we run each payment application as an applet. So let's say Visa application would be one applet uh, we can put on such card. These are the steps of the transactions. Uh, so first of all, when we handle your card to the merchant, normally they ask uh, what kind of payment method you want to use. So I don't know, you will say, I want to use American Express. So they select this option on their terminal. And the terminal asks the card whether, uh, whether such application is allowed to be used and whether it resides on the card. So if yes, 
it starts, the, the terminal starts initiating the application processing. Um, so the terminal reads all the data from the chip they need uh, to verify both the card and the transaction. Uh, then we have uh, offline data authentication. So uh, actually each steps which are marked in this uh, orange color, uh, they use uh, cryptography. So we have several different methods to authenticate the data on the card. I will explain them later. Uh, then the terminal checks the processing restrictions. So uh, basically checks whether such transaction is allowed. <coughs> If it is allowed, then it proceeds with the cardholder verification. So you can verify your transaction either by, by PIN code or later you can verify it uh, by signature. Some cards also allow uh, signature directly on the terminal. Um, then the terminal does risk management. Uh, so it decides whether, uh, whether the transaction should go offline or whether it can be processed, uh, uh, sorry, whether the transaction should be taken online or whether it can be processed offline. Um, this basically means normally in, the, in your card there is specified a threshold. Uh, if you buy something within the threshold, let's say, I don't know, maybe 20,000 uh, rupees, um, the transaction can be done immediately without uh, checking uh, the, the, with the bank. Uh, whenever a transaction uh, takes higher amount, it always goes offline and uh, checks whether you have enough funds, etc. Uh, so the terminal action analysis uh, basically tells the card whether it will process it online or offline, and if online, then it will ask for, for additional data. So uh, then we go for online processing uh, in case it is decided, or we go directly uh, to the completion. So in the final step, uh, basically it is decided uh, whether the transaction is approved or declined. So the offline data authentication step is uh, important here uh, because it verifies whether the card is, uh, <clears throat> is valid. Uh, there are three different methods which uh, differ greatly. Uh, currently, dynamic uh, authentication is the most prevalent. Uh, <clears throat> if we have the static authentication, uh, it just ensures the data read from the card has been signed by the card issuer. Uh, this method prevents the modification of the data on the card, but it doesn't prevent the cloning. So basically the card has its application data and it has the signature of this application data which is, uh, which is signed by the issuer's private key, which is the bank. So the terminal has the public key in order to verify uh, whether the signature is valid. So how it works, the, the card sends both the signature and the application data and then the uh, the terminal can check uh, whether it was really signed with this key, so whether the integrity uh, is there. Of course, uh, you can clone both the application data and the signature. Nothing prevents you from doing that. So uh, that's why we have the dynamic uh, authentication. For the dynamic one, uh, the card has its own RSA keeper, and uh, it has a public key certificate which is signed by the issuer, so by the bank which issued uh, the card. So in this uh, type of authentication, the card will send <coughs> its uh, public key certificate uh, to the terminal. Uh, terminal will, will verify whether the certificate is valid and really signed by the bank. And then it uh, follows a standard challenge response protocol so it will send some random data to the card and uh, the card will sign it and the terminal will check whether the signature is valid and whether it is really signed by the key which was uh, issued by the bank. 
Um, and then there is a combined data authentication, which is uh, only used for some specific markets at the moment. I won't go into details, but uh, in this type of authentication, uh, not only the the card is is uh, validated, but also the the transaction. And then another step, which is cryptography, is uh, terminal action analysis, where the terminal decides whether to go offline or online, or whether to reject the transaction. So uh, uh, terminal sends its decision with the request to generate the application cryptograph on the card. And the card generates this application cryptogram uh, by using symmetric crypto, uh, <coughs> which is sent back to the terminal. So in this case, the, the card uses uh, uh, make algorithm three, which I will explain later, uh, because the sectional attack I will be describing uh, will be actually on this make algorithm three. So <coughs> apart from verifying whether the card is uh, functionally secure, <coughs> we also need uh, to check the, the physical attacks. So, uh, for example, yesterday I was showing you uh, one one way to, to check the security against uh, fault injection attacks, uh, but we also need to consider side channel attacks. So, uh, <coughs> there are several assets on the card which have to be protected. Uh, <coughs> we have, for example, cryptographic keys or a pin code. So, these are always uh, always used in the transactions. So in case we don't have a strong protocols, strong cryptography, and strong countermeasures, uh, we, can, we can recover the information on these assets. So for example, when it comes to RSA keys, uh, they can be recovered by, uh, by different types of side channel attacks. I will detail these attacks uh, later. When we have desk keys, they can be recovered both, both by uh, side channel attacks and by fault attacks. Similarly, the, the pin code is normally encrypted by RSA. So if we can do such an attack, again, we can recover the pin code which is used. And then there is another thing. Uh, we, can, we can actually bias the decision uh, whether to go online or offline uh, by a fault injection attack. So there is normally a decision module which asks, okay, if this condition holds, then we go offline, otherwise we go online. So this brings us to the certification process. So how do we ensure that all the cards are set and uh, the transaction is actually secure? So the testing is performed uh, not uh, directly by EMVCO because they only release the guidelines, uh, but by laboratories around the world which are accredited by EMVCO to provide such a certification. So they need to have extensive equipment and uh, basically whenever some vendor wants to start manufacturing a credit card, the card has to go uh, through extensive series of testing which normally take a long time uh, to get approval before you can send it uh, to, let's say, Visa or MasterCard. Uh, so we have uh, three different components. Uh, the first components are uh, functional, and the last component is, uh, is the security. So in the first two components, basically, we are first checking whether the terminal uh, works well. So whenever someone wants to issue a new terminal, we need to ensure uh, it confirms to all the protocol specification and uh, whether the, the software works properly, whether there are no bugs, etc. And then in a similar way, we first check whether the, ta whether the card uh, can handle the operation of the, uh, of the EMV protocols. So if, if the card is fine, uh, according to functional specifications, then we can start checking the security. Um, so there we check whether 
we have sufficient assurance of certain minimal levels of security, and also whether the card can withstand uh, uh, common attacks. Of course, this uh, comes with the risk analysis uh, I will talk about later. Uh, when we go into the security evaluation, uh, the card itself is actually uh, quite complex, uh, complex thing. So we can't uh, uh, just uh, start checking it as a whole. So we have three different layers. First of all, we check only the integrated circuit uh, without any uh, <coughs> any operating system or any payment application. So this uh, this type of certification uh, normally is done for each integrated circuit. So whenever a manufacturer of integrated circuit, I don't know, for example, NXP or ST Microelectronics or Infineon want to release a chip to be used inside the credit card, they need first to get a stamp that this chip is uh, capable of providing uh, security features. And then we check uh, the platform. So the platform is the combination of the integrated, si integrated circuit and the operating system which runs on this, on this chip. Uh, <clears throat> so still, we don't have any payment application here. Uh, we only have the card and the operating system. So it is still being checked whether this combination will provide enough security in case it is needed. And finally, we have the integrated circuit card or ICC, or it's called uh, also the final product, which uh, again contains both the, the IC and the OS, but it also contains the, the payment application. So this is the final testing. So you have the, the entire card, which has the, the circuit and the operating system, and it has also the, uh, the payment application, like uh, American Express or Visa and uh, <coughs> it is certified as a full product. So um, EMVCO, it supports the work of a specific subgroup of uh, common criteria, which is called JHAS. Uh, and this group basically uh, periodically checks for new attacks and new countermeasures and issues the guidelines. Because the security evolves over time and um, each product has to be checked for the current state of the art. Uh, <clears throat> important thing to mention here is that uh, we are not trying to make the, the card uh, absolutely secure, because this is basically not, po uh, not uh, possible. Uh, whenever you have uh, attacker which can invest enough funds and uh, uh, can, can hire enough experts to break the card, they will always break the card. <clears throat> so uh, we need to reflect uh, the current state of the art. Uh, of course, it is not possible to, to consider all the future attacks which can come. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, what, we are, what we are caring for is what kind of reward the attacker can get from, uh, uh, from breaking the card. So if uh, the attacker needs equipment for a couple of millions of dollars, like uh, scanning electron microscopes, for example, or, uh, or X-ray, or uh, some gamma rays, uh, <clears throat> he can most probably break the card. But the question is uh, how much money he can get from breaking such card. And also, how long does he need uh, to break the card with such equipment? Because normally, if, uh, if your card is stolen, uh, I guess you would realize within one, two days. So uh, if, the, if the attack takes longer, it doesn't make sense for the attacker. I already mentioned a little bit uh, on uh, card assets. Uh, basically, there are two classes of assets. We have a primary assets and we have secondary assets. So the primary ones are the ones, uh, if they are compromised, um, they can be directly used uh, to withdraw the funds from the user's account. 
And then we have the secondary assets. Uh, in these assets, uh, the attacker can normally learn about uh, the transactions which were done with the card, or he can learn uh, some specific details on the card, like uh, the layout of the chip, the details of the process the chip was manufactured with, or the code uh, which is on the card. So, as I mentioned, uh, we always need to check for new types of attack vectors. So for the current version of the guidelines, uh, whenever we are checking a credit card, we need to check all these types of attacks. So uh, <clears throat> they range from uh, reverse engineering, uh, fault attacks, such on attacks, up to the protocol attacks, uh, replay attacks, etc. So basically all kinds of uh, attacks you can imagine, uh, they always need to be tested. And uh, <clears throat> this JHA subgroup um, both defines uh, on what kind of attacks have to be checked uh, and how to how to calculate uh, the attack potential. So uh, uh, there are several factors which have to be taken into account uh, when we when we check the security of the card. So it's not just whether we find an attack or not, but we also need to calculate. Uh, <coughs> what is the probability to make such attack, and what is the cost. Um, another thing is it may be not necessary to carry out all the experiments to identify the attack. For example, if we have a uh, desk key, which is 56 bits, um, if you are evaluating the card, it doesn't mean you always need to recover the entire key. Uh, it is uh, normally enough if you can show you can recover one byte, and that you can extend the attack to all the other bytes. <clears throat> uh, there are two different uh, phases for the evaluation and for the rating, uh, how, how the security of the card is uh, calculated. Um, <clears throat> we have identification and we have the exploitation. Uh, <clears throat> the identification means we are trying to identify the attack which can be used. So first of all, we, we set up the equipment. Uh, let's say we open the cart. Uh, we, we remove the glue. Then we start setting up the protocol. So we will, we will have the scripts for the communication. Uh, then we set up the, the scripts uh, for the actual attack. So for the key recovery, etc. So all these. Uh, basically uh, handle the construction of the first attack. But the exploitation part, it is the part where we assume we already have all these, and now we are taking a brand new card. Uh, how much effort we need to break the card if we already have all the equipment necessary and uh, all, the, all the tools and scripts. Uh, uh, by the way, TOE uh, is a uh, target of evaluation, so basically the card. Uh, yes, yeah, so now I will just explain uh, very briefly how each part uh, is, is calculated. <clears throat> so basically for, for, for each element uh, which contributes uh, to evaluation, we assign a certain number. So uh, the lower the number, the easier to do the attack. So the, the very first thing is to, to check how much time the attacker needs uh, to break the product. So for identification, we normally assume, uh, assume lower numbers uh, because uh, normally the attacker, the attacker, if he has a certain number of cards, he doesn't need to care whether the card was, uh, card was revoked or not. He can take his time to, to do the full identification of the attack. And then for the exploitation, uh, it means he somehow manages to steal the card or obtain the card by some other means, and he wants to do the attack as quickly as possible. 
Uh, <coughs> then, of course, we need to count in the expertise. Again, we have several levels of expertise, uh, ranging from expert, which uh, which is basically someone who knows all the protocols, all the cryptography uh, which is used, uh, the hardware structures, etc., and also he knows very well the current attack techniques and the tools. Uh, then we have someone proficient. Uh, normally, the proficient uh, person is someone who uh, who already has the tools and has the scripts, etc. So he basically knows how to run the attack, but uh, might not know exactly what is what is happening. And then we have a layman. Uh, that is someone who has no particular expertise. So basically, anyone uh, with uh, just certain basic knowledge of computer science. Uh, the extent of expertise uh, is counted both in how well the attacker knows the equipment and also uh, how is his knowledge on uh, on different things. So of course, like uh, the very basic equipment uh, to be able to use such an attack is uh, is the oscilloscope or the microscope to open the card. Um, <coughs> And uh, normally, the basic knowledge would be common cryptography, and then some details on uh, on such on attacks and fault attacks. So again, we assign the value, uh, ranging from layman uh, to multiple experts. Uh, by multiple experts, we mean uh, we have expert in each of the domains. So we have some expert cryptographer, and then we have expert on such on attacks, expert on hardware, etc. Then uh, we write the knowledge of the target of evaluation. Uh, basically, it means how much information the attacker needs uh, about the card to do the attack. So, um, for example, it ranges from public information, which can be obtained by anyone. So, if you just search on the internet uh, on the credit card, you would uh, you would typically get uh, get this information up to the very critical information. Uh, this type of information is known or only by very few individuals within the developer company. Normally, it is controlled on a very strict uh, need-to-know basis. So this is very uh, unlikely that someone who has such critical application, critical information would actually go to compromise uh, a credit card. So yeah, again, we assign the numbers depending on, on the extent of expertise, uh, sorry, extent of, of knowledge of the, of the card. Um, then another one which doesn't need much explanation is the access, uh, access to the to different number of cards. Uh, so here, normally for identification, it is relatively easy to have higher number of cards. Uh, we can we can sometimes obtain them just by buying them from the from the manufacturer and then just testing how to open it how the protocols work etc uh, of course for the exploitation we need to assign higher numbers depending how much samples the attacker need to to compromise the card uh, and now we have the equipment so uh Normally, we need some equipment, so, so the first, uh, first ballot is not really uh, practical for physical attacks. Um, then we have a standard equipment, which you can basically buy in some store or download from the internet. Uh, then a specialized equipment, which can cost, uh, let's say, tens of thousands of dollars. And then we have bespoke equipment, uh, which can cost a couple of hundreds of thousands or it is like equipment specifically tailored for this uh, one task. Uh, <clears throat> these are several examples. So of course, the standard equipment would be, let's say, the voltage supply or, or a computer. Uh, in the specialized, we rate 
uh, basically all the equipment which is needed for standard physical attacks, such as uh, oscilloscope or lasers. And as a bespoke, apart from the tools which are directly manufactured for the attack, uh, we have uh, <coughs> equipment which is really expensive and uh, you need really high skilled experts to operate it, like uh, ion beams or uh, scanning electron microscopes. So yeah, again we assign uh, the rating to the equipment. And uh, then there is one thing which is uh, maybe not that uh, easy to understand from the, from the first uh, glance. Uh, we have something which is called open samples or samples with known secrets. So this normally doesn't uh, uh, normally you can't use this type uh, for, for the exploitation but you can use it for identification and what does it mean if you have a card you're using for identification uh, you will have a platform in case of open samples, uh, to which you can put your own applied. So uh, on the credit card there will be, let's say, visa application, but you can also put your own applied of some fraudulent application, which will help, help you to recover the secret from this visa application. <clears throat> and then there is, a, there is a thing called uh, samples with known secrets. Uh, so this is somehow related you basically have application which is running on your card and you can choose certain specific uh, types of data uh, as you wish. So for example, you can choose the value of your secret key or you can choose the value of pin code and then you can start uh, doing the attack uh, while these, these values are known to you. <coughs> so basically the intention of these is to do even uh, stronger security testing, uh, like whether uh, whether you can get something if you deactivate the, the application countermeasures of the, of the payment uh, applications. Uh, so again, there are several ratings. Uh, if you have a public one, it means there is no protection of the samples, uh, or uh, the platform is used in combination with non-secure applications. Uh, <clears throat> in samples with no secrets, uh, these secrets are easily deducible. So let's say we have a pin code which is all zeros, or we have a secret key which is all zeros, etc. And uh, it ranges all the way up to the critical, uh, where the open samples are protected at the implementation level or a design level. And uh, samples with no secrets where any secret which is, uh, which is used in the card is generated within the card and uh, it is never shared anywhere outside the card. Uh, so as I mentioned, this only works for identification phase. Uh, in the exploitation phase, uh, there is no way uh, you could obtain some credit card from someone and be able to install your own application. And uh, now we, we put all of this together. So uh, whenever we do the evaluation, we assign the values for each of these factors and we sum it up. Uh, we sum it up uh, all together with the identification and the exploitation phase. And then we get the final rating on how our TOE is uh, resistant uh, to attackers. So the, the EMV core requirement is high. So uh, whenever you are, you are assigning, uh, whenever you do the attack, sorry, and, uh, and you calculate the attack potential, uh, <coughs> you need to have 31 points or more in order to be able to, uh, to say the attack is not practical. Uh, so let me show you an example, which is a side channel attack. Um, so uh, let's say we found a vulnerability in a card where we can recover the keys uh, with the side channel attack. 
So our attack vector is the power measurement of the supply voltage of the card with the digital oscilloscope. So what does it mean? We do the encryptions, we collect the, uh, the power, power traces from the power supply of the card, and then we run the, the key recovery. Uh, so so the, the information on the key is leaked uh, through this uh, power measurement. Depending on the asset, we can use uh, different attack methods, uh, like a simple power analysis or differential power analysis. Uh, I will be explaining this later. Uh, what are our preconditions? So of course, we need to know decent knowledge of cryptographic implementations. Uh, <clears throat> then we need to know uh, the current such attack methods and tools. And we also need some experience with the equipment. Uh, so normally, uh, with a digital oscilloscope, so we can set it up uh, to, to capture the, the interesting part of the trace and then run the, the attack script. And of course, for all this, uh, we need to know the communication protocols uh, which are residing on the card. And uh, let's say we broke the card, so then we start assigning uh, the values. So for the elapsed time, let's say we need to, we need to capture at least 30,000 traces. Uh, and uh, for designing the attack, we need one week for the identification, and uh, we need just one day for exploitation. So uh, depending on this, we, we assign the values for both. Uh, now we check what kind of expertise we need. So let's say we need expert for identification because we need to know uh, everything uh, about the card and about, about the attack methods, but we only need the proficient uh, person for exploitation because we already have the tools and the scripts. So uh, uh, when this is readily available, uh, some person can just uh, run it and uh, obtain the, uh, the secret. Then uh, similarly for the knowledge of the TOE, uh, <clears throat> we need to know the communication protocol. Uh, we don't need to know any other information uh, about the card. Uh, and this we only need to know for the identification because one, we know the communication protocol and we have built our communication scripts. Uh, basically anyone can run the script. And about the access, uh, let's say we only needed 10 samples uh, for both. Regarding the equipment, uh, as it is a such an attack, we need a digital sampling oscilloscope. So this is a specialized equipment uh, so again, we, we, assigned, uh, we assigned the numbers corresponding to these. And uh, in this case, we didn't need any open sample. So we, we were able to recover uh, the keys without putting any uh, special application on the card. So we sum all this up. We get 21 points. And uh, we can see that the 21 corresponds roughly to enhanced basic. Uh, which means this is actually not enough uh, to, to make the card secure. So whenever something like this happens and the evaluation lab does the attack and they, uh, they justify it uh, in these numbers, then the product has to go back to the manufacturer and they have to implement the measures uh, to protect against such attack so that even if, uh, if we can still do the attack, the effort to do the attack is much, much higher uh, to reach 31 points and more. OK, are there any questions uh, regarding this part? If not, I think we can make a, a five minute break before the last part, which are the sectional attacks. Uh, on the cards.
uh, okay so uh, now we can continue with the uh, with the final part of the talk uh, so this part uh, will be illustration of uh, of a sectional attack I won't be going into into very tedious details of the sectional attack but I will present high level uh, idea on uh, how this work um, so uh, in case uh, you are not familiar with what is the sectional attack. Um, you can imagine a burglar who is trying to get into a combination lock, uh, locked safe. <coughs> so if we consider brute force attack, this means enumerating all the possible combinations on his lock uh, in order to get inside. Uh, however, this lock has some physical characteristics uh, and if we can observe the characteristics and uh, get the desired information, it uh, will be much easier for him to break uh, this lock. So for example, for this case, he is using acoustic uh, sexual analysis. Uh, so he is listening uh, to the sound of the lock uh, whenever he rotates it a little bit. So uh, there are normally some kind of uh, teeth which, uh, which fall inside the hole uh, whenever <coughs> the number is correct. Uh, so from this information, he can break the safe uh, much more efficiently. So instead of uh, using, instead of taking weeks uh, to find uh, the possible combination, he can find the combination within uh, one, two hours, let's say. Uh, when, it, uh, when we come to such an attacks in cryptography, uh, <coughs> again, we are observing uh, physical characteristics of our device. Uh, we do it uh, during the encryption process. Um, so this focus on the implementation of the cryptography rather than on the algorithm itself. Of course, the properties of the algorithm are also significant. Um, we have uh, different methods. Uh, these are just uh, the ones which are maybe uh, more prevalent compared to the others. Uh, so actually, mostly the first three are being studied in the literature. Uh, so timing means how long it takes um, to do the encryption. Uh, power analysis, how much, uh, how much current does the device draw during the encryption. Electromagnetic analysis, uh, we can either measure it locally. So uh, if we have very precise electromagnetic analysis, we can uh, check different points of the, of the chip uh, to get the information, or we can just observe the, uh, the electromagnetic analysis, uh, electromagnetic emanation of the entire chip. Uh, then we have the acoustic analysis, which is, um, of course, not that precise. Um, it is sometimes use, used um, in uh, measuring the the volume of the fan, for example, which cools down the device. And then we have the cache analysis. Uh, for example, if you know the, uh, the spectrum meltdown attacks, which were recently done on Intel processors, they use uh, the cache analysis uh, to do these attacks. Um, <clears throat> in general, we divide uh, such an attacks into simple and differential. Uh, simple attacks uh, capture just one measurement. So let's say just one, one uh, power measurement uh, during one encryption, and we already get the information on the secret key from this uh, single measurement. Uh, so these types of attacks exploit the relationship between the operations which are done on the chip and the satchel information. Um, so this is the example of uh, RSA, uh, square and multiply algorithm, uh, where from the executed operations, we can, uh, we can derive whether one or zero was uh, in the secret exponent. How does it work? So uh, we have the secret exponent E, and uh, we have the message X. Um, exponent E is a large binary number. Uh, and uh, 
when we are doing the exponentiation, uh, we need to use some kind of algorithm. So normally, a square and multiply algorithm is applied. Uh, <clears throat> whenever we encounter zero in the exponent, we square the message. If we encounter one, we square and then multiply. So of course, these operations have different uh, power signatures. Um, so uh, square uses this amount of current, multiply um, uses slightly higher amount of current. Uh, so whenever we have a combination of a low current and a high current, uh, we know we have square followed by a multiply, and that can give us, uh, that, that will tell us the exponent bit in this case was one. Otherwise, the exponent uh, was zero. Um, how do we protect this? Um, there are several different methods. We can add dummy operations. Uh, we can have a so-called multiply always algorithm, um, which uh, always does both squaring and multiplication. And in case there was, uh, there was zero, it only uses the, uh, the result of the square. If there was one, it uses the result of the both. Then we have so-called message blinding, where we use, uh, instead of uh, calculating x, uh, we use some random number multiplied by x. Uh, this, this method also protects against the timing leakage. Um, and then we have random operations, so current microcontrollers, uh, which, which perform crypto operations, they often allow you to, to run several calculations at once. So uh, this goes especially for crypto coprocessors, which has several different cores. So each core is calculating RSA algorithm on some different data. And then from the power signature of, or from the EM signature, you can't really distinguish uh, which data uh, is the real data. It is uh, kind of mixed altogether. Uh, of course, the best way to protect is the combination of uh, uh, all of these methods. Um, normally, the, the current uh, banking products, uh, they are very well aware of these attacks, so, so they often uh, provide the means uh, to do all of these countermeasures. But of course, <clears throat> even if the integrated circuit manufacturer has all those countermeasures available uh, on his chip, it doesn't mean the, the company which creates credit card is aware of this. So uh, normally what we need to check is whether they actually uh, stick to the guidelines and whether they really activate all these countermeasures. Um, and then we have differential side channel attacks. Here the attacker uses uh, multiple measurements to filter out the noise, yes? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, normally, you mean ECC, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. normally for uh, public key, uh, I think for all the algorithms, you can use the simple power analysis. Um, and uh, yeah, then, then you apply kind of similar, similar type of countermeasures. Thanks for the question. Uh, so for the differential attacks, um, Unlike the simple attacks where, where we, we check the relationship between operation and the satchel information, here we check the relationship between the process data and the satchel information. <coughs> we, we collect a huge number of measurements. Uh, we divide them, let's say, uh, we divide them based on the first bit, whether the bit, we, we, we take the traces which have first bit zero and all the other bits random, we put them in one group and the ones which have first bit one, we put in the other group. And then we do the, uh, the hypothesis and the correlation. And uh, if, uh, we have, uh, if we have more signal than the noise, we will normally get, uh, get a peak in case our hypothesis is correct. Um, as I mentioned, I will be talking on Mac algorithm three, which is, uh, uh, which is the ISO standard used for calculating the message authentication codes 
in the EMV Co cards. Uh, it is uh, used for generating the application cryptogram. Uh, it uses DS and uh, triple DS uh, to do the code. It is based on cipher blockchaining, uh, which basically means we have several portions uh, of the message. And uh, we do the encryption, and the result of the first encryption is first exhort with the, with the other portion of the message before it goes to another encryption module. And at the very end, we have a triple DES, uh, so we use two different keys, uh, and then we get the result, which is always the, the same length. Uh, just a bit of uh, <coughs> uh, details on DES. Uh, it is a relatively old algorithm. It is with us for uh, roughly 50 years. Uh, it is uh, uh, US FIPS standard, uh, which was superseded by AES uh, roughly 20 years ago. It was fully broken uh, by Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, so the, the, the full uh, brute force attack can be done in 22 hours. Uh, it is a Feistel structure. The key is only 56 bits. Um, <clears throat> so really, it is, if you use the DES alone, it is not enough for any secure application for now. Uh, this is the, the structure of the DES. So it is a Feistel. It has two different parts. Um, uh, IP stands for initial permutation, FP for the final permutation. Um, we have, uh, we have our Feistel F function here, uh, which consists of uh, adding the subkey. Then there is a compressing S box, uh, which takes uh, six bits and, uh, uh, and outputs four. And then there is a permutation. So, so this is the, the F function. Uh, because uh, this uh, was weak, however, still there were devices uh, which only had a coprocessor for DES. Um, they come up with uh, so-called triple DES. Uh, it was effort to make DES resistant uh, to brute force attacks, uh, so kind of to, to enlarge the key space. Uh, there are several different variants, uh, ranging from one keys uh, to three keys. Of course, one key variant, it has the same, uh, same security as a standard DES. Uh, the three key variant is actually vulnerable to meet in the middle attacks, uh, so it provides the same uh, security as the two key variant. Uh, so for the mega algorithm three, uh, uh, a two key variant is used. Um, but for example, for for federal systems, the two key variant is uh, already uh, depreciated. Uh, if you want to break the DES, um, you can basically go to this website. Um, the, the breaking time ranges uh, between 26 hours and three and a half days, depending on how much you pay. So if you are not in a rush, uh, you can pay just $100 and uh, uh, they will decrypt for you. Um, so. Um, if you want to break the Mac algorithm three, which is implemented in, uh, in credit cards, um, actually if it is implemented properly, it is not easy. Uh, so for example, when the chip manufacturer guidelines are obeyed, uh, we can't really uh, recover the key easily. So for example, if uh, there is masking, which is used properly and masks all the sensitive computations, uh, Normally, we can't uh, recover any such information. Um, <clears throat> however, even for mask, uh, which is a random number, you need somehow to combine it with your secret data. So that's another thing which is often not obeyed by, by manufacturers. Uh, they protect the entire algorithm, but they don't protect the mask. So then you can just do the such an attack on whenever the mask is exhorted with, uh, with the secret information and uh, you can already break the algorithm, even if it is protected. Uh, so the breaking uh, requires a combination of such an attack and a brute force attack. Uh, 
Um, uh, yeah, this this side is actually uh, not secure. I think it, these are the older slides. Um, actually, both both portions of the key are recovered by by the brute force. But before we need to get um, uh, some intermediate data, which can be recovered by such an attack, and I will explain how. <coughs> so this is our um, this is our Mac algorithm three. Uh, so our preconditions are. Um, we know the, the initialization vector because it is uh, standardly known in the CBC uh, mode. We know the result, and we can choose the message which goes to the encryption uh, algorithm. Um, so we, often, we always uh, choose M1 to be a constant value, so that uh, this entire part is constant, and we always choose M2 to be a random value uh, to be able to do the statistical attack. So what we do, we measure the leakage at this XOR. So uh, we, we measure the result of the XOR, which is, which is uh, done on operands uh, C1 and M2. So as I mentioned, C1 is constant because M1 is always the same value. And M2 is random, so this is this will allow us um, to statistically correlate the the data with the such an information. After we recover the C1, we actually know know the input to this. We know the output. Uh, we know the initialization vector. So what we can do, we can just do a brute force attack on on uh, on the first key. So uh, as you saw in the previous slides. Uh, basically, you pay $100 and you get the first key. And uh, once you have the first key, you can actually recover all the blocks until the end because always the first key is used. Uh, the message is something you know. So uh, you go all the way up to the last, uh, last input. And now you know the last input to the triple dash you know one portion of the key for the triple S, and you know the result. So again, in the very same way, you can get all the information up to here, and you know all the information from here. So uh, in a very similar fashion, you pay another $100 uh, to recover the, the second key. Uh, so to summarize this part, uh, the main weakness is the, in this is actually uh, a short key length of DES, which allows the brute force attack whenever you know the input and the output to the DES. Um, schemes are very slowly moving to AES, uh, which uh, will eventually eliminate this type of attack. Uh, even if uh, the, the product manufacturer uses proper masking and hiding, which are such on countermeasures, uh, the attack can be easily avoided. As I already mentioned, Current manufacturers are very well aware of these techniques. Uh, normally, they have security teams uh, which lead the design of the countermeasures. Uh, again, uh, risk management is the right approach. Um, so, of course, it requires extensive amount of expertise and equipment uh, to do such type of attack. A uh, number of transactions on the card is limited either to 32,000 or 64,000, so uh, you don't have unlimited number of trials and errors. Uh, and normally the attacker doesn't have uh, knowledge what kind of chip is inside the card, but the evaluator does. So uh, whenever the evaluator says the card is secure, it, uh, normally the, the attacker doesn't have uh, many chances to break it. Uh, similarly, if the card is reported as stolen, uh, all the secrets uh, become uh, useless immediately. Um, so to conclude my talk, um, as you saw, the security of payment cards has gone a long way, uh, all the way from embossed cards, which uh, all the all, or the magnetic cards, which had absolutely no protection, to the uh, relatively strong cryptography in the current uh, versions of the cards. Um, the evaluation processes of EMVCO are very well defined. As you saw, the assigning of uh, 
of uh, different values for, for all the different factors which contribute to the attack is, uh, is well defined. Um, of course, nowadays the payment systems are moving from the physical cards to virtual cards which are on your phones. Uh, not only that, but there are completely new schemes, uh, for example, WeChat, Alipay, uh, which are very prevalent in China. Uh, so these, <coughs> of course, have very different protocols and also very different uh, evaluation processes. Uh, and uh, maybe the last thing I want to mention is that uh, before the, the banks and, uh, and the schemes, uh, the schemes like uh, Visa, uh, MasterCard, etc., uh, were all relying on the insurance protection, but now there is a visible shift from the insurance protection uh, to enhance security. And in the very end, uh, the end customers like us are actually benefiting from this because the, the annual fees for the cars, uh, cards can go uh, much lower. Um, in case uh, you want uh, some additional reading, uh, in the first paper, if you're interested in how this such an attack on Mac Algorithm 3 works, uh, you can read the paper. They describe it uh, very well in uh, sufficient detail. Uh, <coughs> uh, these two documents specify uh, the entire EMV chip technology and the evaluation process. And finally, uh, the joint interpretation library document from JHAS uh, shows uh, how, to, how to calculate this attack potential. So uh, this is where I took the numbers from. And uh, they describe in, uh, in much, uh, much higher details how, how to assign the values so that uh, the evolution laboratories um, all know how to how to how to proceed with the evaluation. Okay, that would conclude my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention. In case there are any questions, feel free to ask.